Made in New Orleans is underwritten by Art Plus Design Magazine, New Orleans Auction Galleries, and New Orleans Living Magazine. Welcome to Made in New Orleans. I'm Steve Martin. Thank you for joining us. Each week we highlight local artists and their work. Tonight we're joined by artists Aaron Reichert and Francis Swaggart. First, let's learn more about Aaron in this short feature. Well, I spent uh, many years in, in Chicago where I was an actor and after a time that ran its course, I spent a, a little bit of time just exploring the country and through a series of circumstances, I ended up in New Orleans. And initially in New Orleans, I was doing film work and that afforded me a lot of downtime that I had to fill. And I started just working, doing um, painting. And before long, I had just stacks of paintings. And people would say, you should show these. But I had no idea, I didn't have, a, I didn't have an art background really. So I just started, uh, hit in the street and went down to Julia Street, took a little CD with me and showed everybody. And a few people uh, showed some interest and I was able to get in with, uh, with Steve Martin for a time at his gallery. That's really what opened up the doors for me as far as having work uh, and, and establishing myself in the city. Yeah. At the time when I started painting, people were talking about Lincoln and I was over in Savannah and I was sort of taking in the South and realizing I didn't know much about that at all, like that conflict. And, and so I started reading a ton about the Civil War and became very, very interested in it. And then I felt like I wanted to do something to, you know, bring to life my enthusiasm about, the, about what I was reading. The way that I express enthusiasm has always been through painting people that captivate me or catch my attention. Even if you don't know anything about Lincoln, he just has such an interesting face. Um, specifically, his face is, uh, is so tragic, and yet you feel as though he's trying, to, he's trying to put a happy face on something that's clearly tearing him apart. Uh, he became sort of the springboard for what I do. My favorite way to do it, if, if it is possible, is to work with a living person, a living model. Um, because I, I really look at, at painting from life. If you're painting a human being, it's, it's totally a collaboration between me and them. I went to the monochromatic because I have always been attracted to black and white personally. It wasn't like I was driven to do all this stuff. I simply was doing it because I enjoyed it. And what I realized is that if you do something over and over and over again, it takes on a life of its own without you having to push it. Like it becomes, you know, it may be slowly, but it will evolve and become its own thing. I always enjoyed working in large scale, but I was never able to, frankly, because there's no way to transport these, these things that I wanted to do. And even now, I wish I could do paintings that were like 10 feet by eight, you know, I, I would love to do monstrous scale. But when you have something that's large, what's fun to do is to fill up all of that space with, with, uh, with whatever you fancy to put there. Uh, and so when I was starting to work large, suddenly I had this, this giant playground, you know, of, of hills and valleys. It's a portrait, but it's, it is a landscape of features and then you step back from the landscape and there's the whole face, you know? And I found that very exciting to have two or perhaps more experiences and, you know, the one from afar and then the one when you step up real close and see all the workings of what's going on. I always enjoyed that in painting. It's a big part of what I do. 
I remember a guy talking to him and he said, it's, your work is almost as if you, you took a portrait and it exploded and then it's settling. And it's just before all the pieces have settled and it's, and there's where you did the portrait. And I love that, you know, that's not at all what I ever thought about what I was doing. Um, but I love that idea, you know. <laughs> Maybe it's just our culture, but all this is focus on the point that you'll get to, the thing that you'll finally get to where you'll be validated. You know, okay, finally he did this and, and he's validated. I don't necessarily have a big goal that I'm working towards. I think the biggest goal is simply to be present along the way, actively present, let's say, to not simply lose yourself within your ambition and lose sight of all the good things that are happening all around you, the good people that are pulling for you, people that you could be pulling for. And so I think a good, a good kind of success, if I could get there, would be to, to do what I love and remain present. And now we're back with Aaron Reichert. Aaron, thanks for coming in today. Oh, thank you. Us. It's good to see you again. Thank you, Steve. Um, let's get started with, uh, you know, your childhood and, and, and maybe your journey from there to here. How did you end oh, up in New Orleans? Well, like so many times when people ask, are asked that question, there's, it's, it's kind of confusing even to the person. Um, it was just a series of circumstances uh, for a number of years, I acted in Chicago, and I thought that I would be there. I thought I'd end up in New York doing that. Um, then there came a time when that didn't appeal to me, and suddenly I had nothing tying me to Chicago, and I could go anywhere. So I decided to see the country a little bit, and over the next few years, uh, I lived in a couple of different locations. And just kind of happenstance, I ended up in New Orleans to visit a friend here, and I really enjoyed it. Kind of grows on you, Dad. Oh, yeah. It was <laughs> so lovely. I mean, so lovely. And so I thought, well, shoot, I'll come here and try this out for a while. And um, well, just after a little bit of time, I was able to start producing work um, in the downtime that I had. And then the work just sort of took on a life of its own. And that has been sort of what's kept me here ever since. Now, you, we, you came to New Orleans in what year? I believe it was 2008. Okay, so you, you're new on the scene, and you've had yeah. what I would call a, a meteoric rise ah. in, the, in, in, in your career here. Um, you started out in acting. I know you play music. Mm -hmm. Did you come here to act, or, or did you, you just came to visit, and did you start out in art here, or was that a, a byproduct of killing time? Uh, well, I did come here initially to get work in film because uh, previously, I'd always supported myself as uh, a theater uh, carpenter, building mm -hmm. scenery, and so I was looking to do that in film, and I did do that for a while. But one of the challenges in, in film is that you'll work very, very hard, and then the show will end, and you'll just be sitting there with nothing for so, months. So what inspired you to pick up a paintbrush and start <laughs> uh, I was going out of my mind, quite frankly, with just uh, just being idle. Like I would take these little trips, I'd visit everybody I could think of, and then I'd still have time. So I'd always enjoyed uh, art sort of in the back of my mind. I would work on little things here and there. But because I had so much time, I just started doing all kinds of work. And then I started to sort of feel that the film wasn't really holding me. I didn't really see a future for myself in that work. And I just started focusing more and more and more time on the on the painting. Right. So, well, you've you've developed in a very short uh, time span a, a very definite style, and that's probably one of the hardest things for an artist to to do is develop mm -hmm. their own unique uh, vision and voice in their in their work. Um, so you you started out um, on Julia Street in the, in the gallery. Um, and then you've, you've had some success in, in other areas. Um, what, what would you say your goal is in, in your, your moving through the art scene here in New Orleans? Oh, well, I, to be honest, I perhaps should think more about that <laughs> because I, <laughs> I sort of exist more on just a day-to-day, -day, um, a day-to-day -day sort of schedule of, of the, Man, the project I'm working on. There's so nothing on. wrong with living one day at a time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, I am always talking about looking to find uh, further markets um, uh, beyond, like I, I feel very good about where I am in New Orleans, but then I would love to be 
in a major city or several major cities. So this is something that I'm always uh, strategizing about. Um, but in terms of the work right in New Orleans, I feel like I've, I'm pretty pleased with where I am right now. I feel like I have a solid gallery uh, behind me and I'm just so happy to be, you know, included within the scene that's going on here at, at this time. Right. Now we saw in your segment um, you painting and discussing your painting somewhat, but why don't you go back and talk a little bit about your style? I think if, if I can think back to it, it, it just sort of came out of um, like black and white uh, imagery from the Civil War, which what, just coincidentally in 2008 I was becoming really interested in the Civil War, in part having moved to the South. Um, and so uh, I sort of coupled these images of Lincoln that I, that I became fascinated with. I, I took those images and, and wanted to work on them in, in some way. And I had in my mind um, this sort of illustrative artist named Stephen Gamble who did those, this book that I used to read when I was a kid, The, the Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, these right. really creepy, smoky, images and I was really attracted to the way that he would take smoke and make something sort of come out of it. It was so different from what I'd ever done which was very specific and detailed, you know, hyper detailed. And so I thought, how the heck does he do this? So I sat down to try to do it and did not do it ultimately like you never do if you try to copy someone, right? Right. But other things started to happen and so I thought, well shoot, you know, this was a great entry point and now I have all these ideas that I want to follow. Right, one thing leads to another. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, so uh, featuring icons, uh, you, you started with history and then you moved into music which is another love of yours mm -hmm. and uh, now you're, you're moving into figurative, more full yeah. figures mm -hmm. uh, but still all with the, um, with the, how would you describe it, the internal detached pieces that, that make up a body of... A, yeah. Uh, it's all uh, the the detailing that happens within the, the paintings that I do. Um, it's just sort of um, intuitive. It's just sort of um, a response to whatever's surrounding it. And as you, as I work closer and closer and closer, um, that field obviously becomes more and more minute. And then so I'll jump back and see how everything looks. And then if something seems to, uh, again, it's, it's sort of funny to talk about because it's very much just sort of an intuitive process. Right. It's, it, you, you're there in the moment, yeah. you're working with it, it's developing. Right. And oftentimes it doesn't work at all. <laughs> and then you have to scrap so much of it and start all over. But every crazy. time you go down one of those roads, you discover something <laughs> new that you can I use. Guess. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I find yeah. all the time. I, My happy accidents I, make a new piece of art. That's true. Yeah, you, you've shown on Julia Street, you're showing currently on Royal Street and you've had success uh, around the country and actually internationally so mm -hmm. um, tell me if, if you're how you how your um, view of, of New Orleans when you're in Switzerland uh, how that comes back into play are you excited about being in those international venues I, I know that's the answer is yes but sure. how does um, the international scene see New Orleans or see you in those shows uh, people are always very curious about New Orleans. I, I feel a little um, out of place when people question me too much about New Orleans because I'm not from New Orleans, so I cannot claim to have a real, uh, to have real roots in the city, though I do love the city. Uh, but I am sort of flattered when people associate me with New Orleans and, and sort of want, and I can say, oh, well, in New Orleans, you know, things are, things are going all right, you know, and, um, but in terms of being in these other cities, uh, I just sort of look at it as an opportunity to uh, be out in the world and right. sort of get a, a feeling for, you know, you're so used to this one little place that you're in, uh, and then you step into a, a city like New York or when you're over like in Rome, and it's just a wonderful opportunity to walk down uh, into a place that's so completely different right. and, and experience that. And the art fair scene. Mm -hmm. is, is much different than just day-to-day -day gallery yeah. showing. Um, you've shown in the Armory show in New York? Uh, no, not no? there. It was, uh, it's called Scope, Scope. The, the show that I did. Okay, in mm -hmm. both New York and Basel, Switzerland? In Switzerland, Okay, correct. Yeah. Well, that's quite an accomplishment. Yeah. So, 
being as experienced as you are now in your short <laughs> in your short career, how would you um, advise a younger generation of artists how they could make their living, how could they could make a viable living as an artist? Um, well, there's. I'm always torn when I talk about this. I, I sort of joke that sometimes you start talking about art. <laughs> I start talking about art and end up talking about money, which is embarrassing, but it's, um, it is a factor that you have to consider unless you don't have to, unless you have somehow money that you can just use to support yourself. But if you are truly looking to support yourself from art, um, uh, one thought that occurs to me is to focus on, let's say, one, one thing that will become your thing. Um, because it, it just seems as though a lot of collectors like to say, oh, you're the guy who does the whatevers, who does the, you know, the black and white images, who does the faces, who does the blue dog. Okay, you're the guy who does that. And, and while you may do many, many, many other things, um, it's easier for people looking to buy art to be able to sort of say, you're this person. Like, I think they call it branding, isn't that, is that the appropriate word? Right, or branding. Like it, it, it gives you a definable look. But, sure. uh, you know, what I've found with, with, and I know you, so I can say this, and, sure. and myself included, we, we really work for ourselves and, and paint something that's within us, mm -hmm. and it just so happens that people are, are willing to buy it, which is validation mm. uh, somewhat for the work. Is that an accurate statement oh yeah for sure yeah I tried to I tried to say something like that when we met the last time when we were speaking um, I feel like it's very important and I, I kind of like when we were speaking last time I remember mentioning that's one of the things that gets me down with with the art scene is that there's so many artists that are not feeling good about themselves simply because their work is not being sold and you anybody can look at it and see it's good work but maybe they're not in a gallery or maybe their work is just not, you know, where am I going to put this? It's awesome, but it's really strange. Where am I going to put this in my house, right. you know? So, so, so is advice to a younger artist that's, that's trying to break into the art scene, we can both say, it's okay to sell your work. It's okay yeah. to be successful. You're not a sellout. It's, yeah. it's, it's a part of the business and it allows you to do what you do, yeah. right? Well, the, the whole concept of the sellout is something that kind of, kind of gets me annoyed when people bring that up or s I heard somebody say at one point well if you're selling work you're a sellout I mean if, if you're you know very dismissively and I thought well then how the heck are you gonna live right. if you don't sell in some manner right. you know you have to uh, if you really want to survive you have to in some way think rationally um, uh, and sort of strategically how am I gonna make this thing that I love to do make money for me and it doesn't have to all be about that, of course not, right. but there's a certain element, a certain percentage of your time needs to be devoted towards simply being able to live, right. make money. Aaron, thank you very much for coming into the studio and letting us all um, hear you talk and meet you today. You can see Aaron's work at Gallery Orange on Royal Street. Well, right now we're gonna take a quick break and we'll be right back. In the search for beautiful people, music that moves, and real culture, America, there's only one L.A. Coast. Go Coast, Louisiana, delivers the treasures of the Gulf, fresh to you. I think we need a bigger boat. Sundays at 8.30 p.m. on L.A.E. You're watching WLAE, New Orleans Public Television. Find us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Welcome back to Made in New Orleans. We're joined now by local artist Francis Swaggart, who is a master printer. Francis, I want to thank you for coming into the studio today to be with well, us. Well, it's fun to be here and it, good to see you again. It is good to see you again. Now, we've known each other forever, it seems. Mm -hmm. and, and uh, so I guess I want to start there. H how long have you actually been working in New Orleans in, in art? I really have been, uh, you know, I'm, I'm born here, but discovered I love to draw in kindergarten. Okay. It's been, you know, 
it's it's just right there. Right. <laughs> so so it's been a lifelong uh, it really love. Has. And you specialize as a master printer. You have a special press, and you're you're uh, famous for your etchings. So what drew you to doing etchings and print work? I learned the medium. Was introduced to the medium at Newcomb. Okay. Which was the first time I'd ever seen a press, and just locked into it like this is mine. It fit <laughs> right. Well, there's a there's a cool story on your website that that goes a little deeper than that as well, yeah. and it may be some reason for the connection that you felt with printmaking. I really think so, Steve. Um, but I can't explain it any any other way than it just happened, but um, many years after I learned the medium, I finally had my own studio, and it, of course, always takes us a while to have the, gather the presses and the space for the presses and have it to be your own space. Uh, rather than a, a space within a school, which is where you usually find these um, studios. Right. My father walked in the door to see my studio for the first time and said, oh my God, my, grand, my dad had a studio just like this. And you'd never so met him. Had, he died long before I was born. And my dad had not told me anything until this day, the, the day he took a look at my press. Right. But um, yeah, there it was, and it's um, he. It was his medium. He was a professional. Um, it was called photo engraving at the time, because you you he still used the old 16th century medium, which was freehand drawing into the copper. But at that time, it was also used for newspaper printing. Mm -hmm. So he could etch um, advertisements. Why don't you tell me a little bit about a typical day in your studio? How does it, how does one start uh, doing what you do? You etch a plate. Give us a, a in layman's terms. Well, I start I start with a, a piece of vellum and a soft pencil, and to do my my drawing. Piece of copper coated with wax. Now the wax is going to resist the acid. Mm -hmm do my loose sketch, and I put that vellum on top of the wax and run it through the press. And when I pull it away, the loose lead mm -hmm. from the pencil gives me a little silvery line to begin with. Then um, you, you take a, a needle, uh, which can be made from anything. It can be a big nail, and you, you draw freehand. Just scratching this is, into the This point. is not gouging like the engraving, mm -hmm. an engraver does. This is just ex going through the soft wax, mm -hmm. so it's as free as, again, drawing on paper. Now, now we've got exposed lines in the wax. You submerge it in your acid, and your acid will eat wherever there's no wax. Mm -hmm. So it digs a trough. Um, take it out of the acid, and proof by wiping ink into those surface grooves. Now, this is where um, you hear etching and engraving kind of flip-flopped in terms. When you get to that printing part, they print the same way, uh, the li but the line is different because of the tool. Um, and then you proof, and then you say, you know, That's I want or this or that want. or the other. Now I go through, um, I go through. Oh my God, this is a mess. Do it again. Do it right. again. Do it again, until I really have a rich, rich surface. Um, at least five different proofs, and dunking in the acid. Right now, you use New Orleans as your subject uh, matter: Mardi Gras, uh, costumes, uh, landscapes. Uh, Building scapes, I do. Right? I do, and um, but but then I delve into I've done some bird cages that are Victorian, and stitch them with beading. Mm -hmm. um, that's another thing about the etching. While we're talking about the etching, um, you get that that etched piece, and then on top of that, there are all kind of applications: gold leaf, watercolor a hand-stitched beading, uh, even pastels. Mm -hmm. Go anything that 
that you might use on a piece of paper, you use on top of that etching. So it's it's just so creative. How many, um, you, when you do a plate, how many images do you normally pull from a plate or do you have a limited editions? I usually set my editions at 100, mm -hmm. but Steve, sometimes I'll, and of course you never print all that 100 because it takes me, I can do five in a day. So I'd, I would print my five, put it in a book so I know where my next number is going to come from. Right. Sometimes I get tired of that color way right. halfway through. Right. Sometimes I just take off in another direction. So it's not, sometimes I get to that hundred, right. particularly if a hotel has commissioned me to do a bunch, that right. hundred. Right. Then I'll really get to my number. Otherwise, it's just that that end number is an option. It's right. not it's not necessarily how many prints get made. Do you do collaborative work with other artists? And can another artist come into your studio I and love, work with you? I love to, to take a professional artist like yourself who has a completely different medium, mm -hmm. who wants to just, just come in and... Expand. Yeah, and just try it out. Um, it feeds, it's so creative for me to, to have a dialogue w like that with the press moving and um, I don't really, I, I don't call that teaching. Right. I just call that Collaboration, collaborating. Right. And um, that's, that's good for me. So how can people find you at, at your studio to, to see your work? Are you showing in any other venues? I, I do have two galleries in New Orleans. Um, and uh, actually three, Hall Barnett, mm -hmm. um, Peter O'Neill, okay. my friend, right. and uh, Kevin Gillantine's gallery okay. here. Okay. And then I really stay in touch with a lot of designers that the work um, is of a style that really enhances the space. Gotcha. That's and, and your studio is located? On Spruce Street. Okay. So that's really so not... So you kind of have the city sewn up with O'Neill and, and the French Quarter and... and I, re on yeah, magazine. I really, yeah. I really can't handle any, anything else <laughs> in New Orleans. Um, but it, but we, get, we get outside of it. I... Um, one of the things I've really enjoyed is being um, the association with the Cushada tribe mm -hmm. and the Tunica tribe, because I've done uh, etchings for their guest rooms, for the, the hotels associated right. with the casinos, and that's that's a, nice job. That's a joy to to work to work with that Native American mindset right. and translate it into an image has been has been a special treat. Okay, Francis, thank you so much for coming into the studio today. We've, we've all learned a lot, and it's, it's always wonderful to see you. So, you know, hope to see you again you. soon. I hope everybody gets a chance to find your work and, and experience it as I have. We're going to take a quick break now, and we'll be right back. Hi, we're Ola High, and you're watching WLAE TV. That's all the time we have tonight. I'm Steve Martin and thanks for watching. Be sure to join us next time on Made in New Orleans. Made in New Orleans is underwritten by Art Plus Design Magazine, New Orleans Auction Galleries, and New Orleans Living Magazine.